You know, one of the bizarre things when you talk about raising the age is um, they say, look at the crime rates committed by 18, 19, and 20 year olds. It's relatively high, and so we shouldn't let them have it. And my point is, well, the type of people who you're stopping now because you're not allowing them to go through the background check to be able to do it, they're not the same as the other ones who aren't going through a background check. And I have some data for like concealed carry permit holders by year of age. And uh, 18, 19, and 20 year old permit holders are, are actually, who have to go through a background check, are actually uh, have lower rates of uh, their permits being revoked or firearms uh, convictions than people who are 21 and older. And so, you know, but you just say so you just can't look at crime by all people 18, 19, and 20, because that's what we're talking about, who that's are going to be stopped. Stat. Is that a big enough pool that you're looking at? Are you able to get the statistic, 18 well, to 20 year olds versus? Well, it's for, I have it for three states. I have it for Nevada, mm -hmm. for Texas, and for uh, Michigan. And, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, it's over a number of years. Uh, so, I mean, I think it's pretty good. Uh, there are not a lot of people in the Texas sample, but the, uh, but, you know, I think it's at least, it shows that it's not the other way. I think there's a statistically mm -hmm. significant result there. And, uh, um, you know, uh, of course, we have, you're going to have somebody here to talk about history. And, of course, one of the ironies is, you know, with the Bruin decision, they're supposed to be looking at uh, kind of, uh, you know, they look at the text of the Second Amendment. If that doesn't do it, then they look at the debate. If that doesn't do it, uh, Thomas says, go and look at what laws were in place in uh, 1791 or in 1868. And the thing is, I mean, I've looked at the stuff, and basically the only laws that you have there in uh, 1791 or around that period were mandates that people of, you know, like 16 and above for Connecticut were mandated to own a rifle. You know, not the opposite that mandating, banning them from owning a rifle. And even Connecticut, as late as 1897, uh, had a mandate that all able-bodied males between 18 and, uh, and 35 were mandated to own a rifle. So, you know, that's well after the period. You know, the, you know it's going to be interesting to see um, what happens when that finally gets to the Supreme Court. You have one... Uh, decision that upset us, upheld Florida's ban in the 11th Circuit, but um, they rely almost extensively on this uh, database that the Duke Law School firearms people put together. And as far as I can tell, it's probably a willful misreading of the original statutes. And you talk about bans from 18 to 21 year olds right. from purchasing firearms. Well, the, yeah. yeah, and. Uh, uh, I think when it gets to the Supreme Court, it's going to be pretty embarrassing for the Duke Law School people. They're legal adults that can fight and die for our country, but they can't buy a firearm. Right. right. Well, I mean, and they're victims of crime, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have 20-year-old uh, women who I'm sure are stalked or threatened. Um, uh, you know, it's, um, there are a couple places. Uh, in Michigan, uh, they just passed a uh, universal background check, and they, you know, a number of states that have universal background checks, they at least have an exception for somebody who's in imminent danger, okay? Which isn't really much of an exception because if you're a lawyer, it means the threat has to be literally right there. So if a woman calls you up on a Friday night in Michigan and she, uh, her ex is threatening to come over, you can't just lend her their gun until the ex is actually there. She can't say, I think in a couple hours he's gonna be there. Right. He, but Michigan, the law that they just passed, doesn't even have an exception for imminent danger. So you can't, and there's like no circumstances that you could lend her your gun. And uh, of course, if it's imminent danger and the threat's right there and you're there to give it to her, you have to take it back as soon as, the, you might as well just keep it yourself and use it defensively. That's so subjective anyway. The Second Amendment is not subjective. Look, I, I, you know, I think they're gonna have all sorts of problems when it comes to court cases on this stuff. But, but they're playing for time. I mean, you have uh, Clarence Thomas is 74. Uh, by the end of the next presidential administration, he'll be 80. Sam Alito is 72. By the end of the next administration, he'll be 78. You lose one of those guys, either one, and uh, you're going to have a very different court. 
I mean, there's a reason why it was basically about 11 years or so before the Bruin decision ca came down, or longer than that, was granted cert. Uh, because you didn't have four justices on the Supreme Court. I guarantee you two of the four that find, it was only when Amy Coney Barrett was added to the court that you had enough justices who were willing to grant cert. Because I don't think Kavanaugh and I don't think uh, Roberts would have granted cert on these things. So you lose, you lose either Thomas or Alito and you're not gonna have those four votes anymore. And of course, the big problem that you have with the Bruin decision is that while you have four justices who completely signed on to Thomas's decision, including Thomas, uh, Kavanaugh and Roberts have a concurrence where they say in theory, they think that Thomas has the right legal reasoning, but then they go and list a whole bunch of laws that are new that wouldn't have passed any of the legal reasoning that Thomas had because they're like laws that have been adopted in the last 20 or 30 or 40 years well after the 1791 or 1868 period. So you basically have <clears throat> judges like power, okay? So you have something like the First Amendment where um, it says Congress shall pass no law. Now that seems pretty clear to most people, but what judges have interpreted it as is basically Congress shall pass no law unless uh, they have a good reason and we in the courts get to determine whether or not they have a good reason or not. Judges, I mean, I've taught in law schools, but judges don't like bright line rules that reduce their power. They like power. They like to be the ones who make decisions on these things. And Thomas, I know his long run view is to basically take what he said in the, uh, with regard to Bruin and the Second Amendment, where he says, look, they say shall not infringe. That seems pretty clear. I'm sure if he got a chance to write a majority opinion that dealt with the First Amendment, he would say shall not, you know, you know, shall not pass a law like that. And he's, and you know, I don't, I, when I was in law school, as I would joke, I'd say, when they say <clears throat> shall not pass a law, what would they have had to write to really mean that? Would they really have to say, <laughs> Congress shall never, ever, 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 and you say, okay, that's enough, eight evers, that means they really meant it at that point. Yeah. All, all that aside, because right, their, their first Supreme Court asserted it, it took the power of ruling whether something's unconstitutional or not. That was something they actually was unclear at the time whether they would do. That was very early. I know, but now they've gone into all these balancing tests and everything. Right? But I, I, when I look at this, and I repeat this a lot in America's First Freedom, I think it's important for people to look. Go and look at, read the Heller and McDonald decisions, five, four decisions. Right. Read the minority opinion in both of those cases. And it's just so clear that the minority, the anti-gun minority there, would love to overturn Heller. Oh, they still would now. Erase all of this and take us back to this place where they say it does, it's not an individual right. You read, you read in Bruin. You read the uh, minority mm -hmm. in the Bruin case. And they, they, I don't think, I think no matter how many cases you have, if they get to get the majority on the Supreme Court, they'll, they'll strike it down. They could take down. all this freedom from us. Right. Right. Well, important so. stuff, John. Well, thanks for your time. Thank you again.